All right, it's uh it's seven. Let's go ahead and start. Tell me tell me all about uh what you've been up to, what you know, if you have any resources that you need or any roadblocks that you're hitting. Yeah, so um I have not um talked to Andreas um and I actually haven't really done anything on the um project. There wasn't uh is this like not there was a, a an email earlier where did you just go off video? Hello. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Yeah, no, I muted so that I the, the birds in my background. I have a RSRE oh. and a cockatiel, and they really like to make extra comments after I stop talking. So that's that's why I uh, sometimes mute. Um, so there was a question. Uh, okay, there was a question that was submitted by. Um, uh, I think it was what Michael from last week. Is that true? Yeah. Um, it was on the board, was it? Wasn't it not on Trello? Well, I'm, lo there. I'm looking at Trello right now because I wanted to show the card for the documentation on HDL Coder and uh, and just give a summary of that. Uh, so I'll, I can I should I can check real quick to see if the if there was the a discussion on Trello. Mm. Where did I get that? I thought I got a notification somewhere on, on there, but he was asking about uh, using a counter or something like that um, with respect to one of the preambles. Yes, that was, I think that was uh, Ed, uh, Ed, Ed Fries. Ed, he, yeah. yeah, yeah, he, he asked, uh, you know, can you do a, uh, I think flip flops, a series of flip flops to replace part of of what we were doing in um, in Simulink, so I I told him that sounded really pretty cool, and to go ahead and and try it, that we could compare the two different approaches from, you know, the more sort Could of high seven, level. Yeah, here it is. I, I found it. Um, I'm looking at Neptune Notes DM coder. Um, are you sharing your screen or not? Or... Hold on. Yeah, you can go ahead and read it. Um, yeah, it was on Slack. He, I think, he asked on Slack about about an alternative, yeah. uh, you know, approach to to one of the the parts of the design. So, so I told him to go ahead and try yeah. it because anything that that lowers the latency, I think we would like to to explore. Yeah. So in the YouTube video, you mentioned that you were using HDL counter to generate a digital prefix generator every 128 clock cycles. You could also use 70 flop slots to divide the clock frequency 128, which would be much smaller and faster than the 8-bit counter. You think this could be used for a prefix generator? Um, right. Yeah, so I I, I think, um, you know, certainly the, the counter would be more efficient because it would use less flip-flops, but 70 flip-flops would also work, right? Yeah, I um, think the... My my instinct is that the the outcome would be the same, um, and that and and that the the maybe the parts count would be different. But but we don't we don't know until we test it, uh, because the the HDL coder process optimizes out uh, a lot of the things that you put into like Simulink. So if you if you create some sort of Rube Goldberg thing in Simulink and, and it says, oh look, I can I can reduce it, then in some cases it will. Not every case, uh, but in but in straightforward cases like this. So I, I just told him to go ahead and try it. I mean I think it's a, a you know if right, if, it, right, right. if it's That's what I'm saying, yeah. It, yeah if it's worth his time, go ahead, go ahead and try it and see. And and it it would give us a little more um illumination or vis you know it would it would show us a little more about the capabilities of the tool too so yeah yeah um let's see here so the one 
question that I had for you, I think you saw this already kind of, um, and I, I've kind of forgotten how to solve it. Uh, let, let's see here if I can, you have sharing turned on. Like I can share. How do I do that here? You're, you're on mute again. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes, you should be able to share. Yeah, I don't, oh, share screen. Okay, so share and then, there we go. Um, okay, so, uh, your screen sharing. How do I get it? Oh, yeah. To, okay, I see uh, the, I, feel like I see the transmitter from the Python model that, uh, for FlexLink. Yeah. Um, anyways, okay, so here we go. Um, so, this thing is number one, not finding this uh, module called visualization. So, what, what, what we're looking at here is um, uh, the code that's in the Git repository and under Neptune. And we got FluxLink as a subdirectory. This is VS Code, um, by the way. It, that's what, what we're looking at. So, there's um, the HDL coder, those are your files. This is what, just the repository, right? So there, there's documents. So there's, you know, 11 right there. And then, then there's a Python file. So in the Python file, there's um, the FlexLink fly, fly. Most of this is essentially code that Andreas has developed. And this is uh, stuff input from Clover Engineering, mainly me. One of the, um, the files here is visualization and, and in here, this is just a class. So you, it allows you to plot data. Yeah. Plot, plot data, plot a constellation. So anyways, so there's oh, different plotting routines. Yeah, it looks really um, useful. Where, where you give it, you know, data, then the names and, and stuff. So, um, Anyways, like here's IQ uh, with two data streams, you know, and two names. A anyways, okay, so um, that's that file, but here I'm trying to import it as this, but um, for some reason, uh, the interpreter doesn't see it. So I, I added, I import sys and OS, then I added syspath insert and put that into the, yeah. The, the the path. So which which means it I mean all of these have the init.py on there, right? So right, um, right. So if we if we look at Python, there's a init.py there, and then in Flux thing there's a init.py here, and Culver, there's a init.py here. So it should be able to reverse this. These are just yeah. empty files though. I mean that's what it is, it's just empty. Um but when I go into um, um, to run this, you know, it inserts that, but then it doesn't see this. So I'm yeah. wondering why. I mean, That's kind of weird. Yeah, that should work. Okay, so, so let, let's um, let's step through it. So I'll I'll um, um I'll stop right there. I'll put a breakpoint right here at this uh, flux link, you know, when it starts importing this stuff. So um, debug Python file. I mean, so now that we're, we're running it, it, it opens up my environment down here. You see that in the terminal. Um, so right here at this point, if I just say um, this dot, you know, path, Right, and I think it's, is it a function? I'm not sure. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, this is the path right here that it prints out and you see it's first, right? Yeah, I do. And then, but, and then these are the other paths that are, you know, associated with it, right? Yeah. Um, which is everything, all the other packages and whatever. Um, but it still doesn't see visualization, dot, you know, on here. So I, if I open up, there's no VIS, you, 
Yeah, I was looking at that. It's it's spelled right. <laughs> and then the, so the file name is correct, and then the class is the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The weird. Um. So why isn't it not importing? So how do we? Um. Um, so that, that that's what one issue right there. Okay, so um, I don't, if uh, if I was hitting this myself, then I I would probably ask Paul if because he's hmm. really pretty good at at Python and very familiar uh, with VS Code and all of its requirements. Um, mm -hmm. So we can run this by. We can run this by Paul and try to see if he can see the problem, and he often does. Uh, and we have a lot of other people really good with uh, with Python uh, in the in the community. So and that are that are also working with VS Code. So I, we have we have a pretty deep bench here. This is kind of weird because I don't to me as a, a I'm probably a more casual user of this than than somebody like Paul or you. Um, I don't see anything wrong with the way this is set up, it should just simply work. Mm, yeah. Let me see here. If I, if I put in the... Um... So the visualization is a class, right? This is a class with some functions. That's it. I right, remember right, looking right, at right. this. Like, it should work. It should work like the parameters, like the cloder, like like that. It, sh yeah. it should work so like the other... In... Oh, go, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah you're right. So... Let's see here. If I, so one one thing that I could do is let's say down here, um, th this is a, so it's Neptune, FlexLink, and that's a, that's a, then Python. So next, yeah. So if I wanted to um, put in the entire um, thing. Right, so we got Python and then we got double thing there and double thing there and double thing there and double thing there. And then I think we got to do that. And then Right, so and then that, so we should be able to do that. So if I just, and then I'll just comment this one out for now, and see if it sees it at that point. So here we, we, okay. yeah, yeah, we, we insert the the full path, right, and not the You're relative right. path, right? Which, well, yeah, yeah. What's, what's the dot? What's the current path? Which I thought it was it was correct. So let me re-kick that off. So, um. So the, the console, right? At this point, so if we just do sys.path again, um, still see that. Did hold on just a second. Is this save? Auto save. Okay, so auto save is not turned on, so that doesn't save it. So save that. Then now, um, now shoot. You know what? Uh, I think I'm starting a new debugger. So let me quit out of that one and quit out of that one. Out of that one. Okay, there we go. Holy shit. Um, do that. So this this button, this uh, little thing here. I need to maybe move it down here. But okay, so now we're here, right? And it still doesn't see it. Yeah, that's weird. Right? Okay, let's and let's 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 try to ask for some help. Well, do you think on? I mean, Andreas. Could probably help with this, right? That seems like the first person to go to since he wrote it. Like it, it must have worked for him. So. Mm -hmm. Well, no, no, no. I'm, I'm adding the visualization thing in here. So he, but he he may know that you're right. So. Yeah, we can ask uh, for or or look at. It, there has to be something from Andreas that we can look at, and I know about uh, some of the. Some of the folks in the in the team can help with this. This is just weird. Like, I am with you. Uh, you know what in the yeah. world? <laughs> it's 
In fact, but, it is hi it's highlighted. But, it's highlighted in white and has a curly curly cue underneath it. It's like something's up here. That's pretty basic. It's got to be something simple. Yeah, report could not be resolved. Pylons re report. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it, it's, so it's, we... it's as if it the import isn't correct. So like, click on that and see like what is it claiming. Yeah, you're. You you can't see what I'm looking at right now, right? Yeah. Well, I can see uh, I mean, the uh, I I can see the source code for for FlexLink transmitter dot pi. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I open. I mean, what this this here uh, gets you into uh, it opens up a web browser uh, a link. So okay. Um. Okay. So um, if we let me just comment that out. And then um, and get out of that. Then I'll I'll stop this guy here. So let's do a quick code walkthrough on the on the code. So um, Andreas is basically in the transmitter, flexing transmitter um, source code. Uh, basically, uh, we're going to create a transmitter, right? So there's a class, flexing transmitter, and in that class. You know, you you do your init. So there's a bunch of self dot configuration sample rate, all that stuff. So, so that's all the kind of parameters that you're going to be using to to build your waveform, right? Right. One thing that I did here also in the init routine is, um, and I talked to him about this. This used to be down in a different function, but the AGC burst, the preamble A and preamble B, those are not going to change for, for let's say, a, a connection when you send something. So I said, okay, well, um, let's just put them up here. They're fixed. And then that way we don't have to generate them each time. Good idea. And then, um, so he's got a thing called build TX waveform that this isn't finished, but in there, you know, you, you go in there and, um, you, you know, you, you start building the different components of the waveform. Um, as part of the debug, you see here, this is commented out, this is where he was building the preamble before, but as, com as, as part of the thing, I was just printing out the um, preamble A, B, and C from the line, mainly just for, that's for debug, and then whatever. So then, then there's, um, he's got a method called encode payload, and then uh, that's where we take our parameters. These are the thing keeps on. Um, these are essentially the same parameters that are um, in the in the document. So yeah, yeah, right. Block size. Right. And, I recognize some of the. I recognize the, the, the the values. That's, that's familiar from the spec. That's good that it maps over. Right. And then he, in this thing here, you can, um, this is your, I suppose your test bench, but you, you can run main. So here to test this thing out, we've got, I've set the sample rate to 2048, which is yeah. essentially, you know, a power of two. Right. And then, yeah, that gives us the 20 kilohertz symbol rate. Right. Why is it, I hate it when it does that. The, <laughs> <laughs> the bread comes, you know, you hot, you go over something and it just yes, yes. And it kind of blocks just, you from doing anything. It's just trying to be very helpful. So we're saying, okay, our bandwidth is 20 megahertz. These, these are enumerated values in, in so FP, FP is defined above, right? Yeah. So if we go to FP, um, where's it? Maybe not. Low, oh, flexing parameters. That's uh, so that's in a file flexing parameters. And then if I uh, back arrow gets me back here. Okay, so then we we start saying, okay, this is our control intro, but um, and this is basically um, this is in the spec as as a as a first column isn't it so if i bring up
Okay, so then then we have the control, the signal field, and this is in the this is in the spec as as that first column here. So you see him building up those various things. I wonder if I can um just a second. Let me uh I'm gonna collapse this. Can you what do you see right now? Well, I still see the screen after you collapsed it. Okay, so if you if you want to screen. Yeah, if you want to switch to a, a to another window, um, then probably the best way is to is to quit sharing and then share a new window or share a new. Yeah. Yeah. That's so just the, the, um, the best way to do it because I still see your your code. The background and everything. Okay. No, just um, the just the code. It's uh the FlexLink transmitter dot py is still on the screen. So if you if, so if you want to switch to another window like to show this back then quit out just stop sharing and then and then take sharing again on the on the new screen. I don't I don't I don't see what you're looking at. Okay, so I'll stop sharing. There you go. Okay. And then, we're and then, we're back um, we're back to our icons in Zoom and then just go ahead and share screen again like choose the new window. Okay, hold on just a second. I need to open, I'm going to open up the um, the um, the document here. I mean, I need to find it first. So, flex one, Python. Yeah. One, okay. Take your time. Uh, docs. Okay, so uh, there's that. All right. So, and then I'm going to jump down to what we were looking at kind of last week: resource group construction. And then, um, okay, so, <clears throat> so in Zoom, I'm going to, hello, <laughs> and there, okay, um, the thing is too intelligent, it keeps on wanting to do whatever it wants to do. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, okay, share the screen. The entire screen sure okay and then uh so now you see the document right oh i do yeah hey that looks familiar yeah okay all and right this so is, yeah this is the stuff our, that we were just uh, talking about <laughs> cool the control symbol here is right here so you you output the agc burst the preamble a and the preamble b and then you output your first reference symbol this is the control information and then your signal field. So if we go back to the code, that's what we're doing. So we're we're populating these parameters, right? Correct. And and then um, as we notice, uh, so in the flux link config we do that, and then in the transmitter, I create it. Well, uh, Andreas creates an instance of the he calls it transmitter. You know that's the name of it but it's of this class. So that calls, um, you know, the init thing and he passes this flex link config. So at, the, at that point, so if we, we can just like run it to here, right? So, um, and it should just pass because now I have this visualization thing commented out. Right. right. Um, so let, let's go ahead and try running that. Um, so we go there, we start running. We, we, I have a breakpoint here at import. Okay, Excellent. So I'm going to unclick that. And then unclick this guy here and then hit play. And it goes to the next breakpoint, which is down here. Now I start, I'm in main and I start um, populating these things. So I'll, I'll go ahead and hit play, jump down to here. And in fact, in uh yeah so it, it should jump down here but not execute this thing right so we'll we'll jump down there now we're there so uh what's nice about vs code is you got a lot of debug information over here so this is all the variables that are created and it, they're local right here to the main what we're on so um we've got a preamble signal field blah 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 blah, blah. And, but we don't have transmitter yet right because it hasn't been executed but what we're going to do is I'll go ahead and step into it using this thing here. So now we're we're in the knit routine. So we go through here and start 
um, uh, let's see here, start populating those things with the stuff that was passed. So um, this thing called configuration was passed in here. You see that it has a bunch of member, you know, functions and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then down here, we, we can just um, run it to here. I'll go ahead and remove that so it doesn't do an exact. So now um, configuration and self, you know, self has got those things in there. So we can see what our parameters are. Right? FFT size is 2048. We're using 2048 because of, you know, our sample rate is 2048. And um, we got essentially 2048 bins. Um, so we set the CRC number of bits, number of subcarriers, right? Right. So according to, so this is 901. What, so what is that? So that is, um, if we go over here to the Word document, right? And we go down to the resource grid. Mm -hmm. You know, the FFT is this. So it right. starts at zero, including zero, and goes up to 900. So you get 901. 900 plus one. So that's not a one. This is the mapping of that FFT. Right. And the extra to, because we mapped to 1024, but the, the difference between 901 and 1024 is the virtual carriers. So there's there's some virtual carriers in the in there that take it out to 1024. Well, so you have a guard band. Correct. Right? Yeah. So so you got um you you have essentially uh k equals zero to nine hundred, that's your usable data. Correct. That's and then what your we guard band be, between the OFDM. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think he's got a. Does he have a, a pictorial of the occupied bandwidth? Uh, I don't know. I think we always, most of us working on this, know what it looks like. But yeah, then, so you, you know. got your you got your pedestal, which is nine hundred and one subcarriers. Right. And that goes down to you know ideally zero, <laughs> um, right. some some number of negative, you know, dB down, 60 dB down or whatever. And, and then that's your guard band between that. So the space between, you know, this is centered at some DC value. And then the space between the 450 and negative 450 to the next, you know, channel is is your guard band. Right. All right, so that's uh, so we go back up here. So we we've got our um, so now we're so we're going to jump out of here, right? So this is the next function right here, build TX24. So if I just step, it should just jump out. Yeah, there we go. So now we start saying, okay, what do we want to send? So we we come up with a um, it's, this is the signal field. So he's 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 making the signal field at this point, right? So we right just step through that. Yeah, we've handled the configuration. Um, we've handled the configuration in another function, but now we're actually building it. Yeah. So that was the uh, the con configuration, right? But now we're doing the signal field. So and then we're also saying Mac bits payload A, right? So um right there number of bytes in payload a is 3850 right and right. that is essentially this thing here and then uh the time so if we say um so now we need to convert it into a bit stream so essentially we're just converting into bytes right so we take the the bytes and if we wanted to look at what I'll go ahead and step a couple times here. Uh, step, step, step. So if we wanted to look at the bytes that we're sending, right, we can go over here and say, oh, what, what does that look like? Um, here, there's a way to, uh, probably there was a way to look at it in here. Hmm. No. 
thought you can just click on it. Okay, maybe not. Um, so now, so the thing is, is if, if we, we're gonna, um, we've created the data that we want to send essentially is what happens here. Then we want to say, okay, we're, we're, bit, we're still trying to build our waveform. We, we've got the preliminary values of the transmitter. So let's just step into that. And um, we're, we're going to do, you know, A load A. So we're going to come, so, so let's see here. So now we're, we're encoding the payload. So we go in there and if I had the visualization stuff turned on, I could down here at the bottom list of quantum signals, we can look at that. So um, I'll go ahead and, and run to there. So now we have a list of QAM signals, right? So that list is in this, you know, we're in that function still. So it's present right here. And where is that list of QAM signals here? Uh, it hasn't executed yet. So, but the QAM signals are, are here. So um, at this point you're appending it to here, but I quite honestly, I, I don't think you need to append it. Quam signals. Here, here's a list of quam signals right here. Yeah, look at that. And and uh, they're all perfect. Yeah. A view value and and data viewer uh, pandas and above the card. <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right. So um, I but like that. if we wanted to. We can say, okay, so um, ram signals. We can look at them. Um, if, we, if we just do cram signals, what do we get? Yeah, so there's a list, right? So they're all perfect cram signals. There's no, you know, oversampling, so you don't see any transmission transition. And at this point we have an array. So if we had a, the visualization routine, we can actually see this as a as a pictorial. So that's right. what I was kind of hoping to see, but we can textually look at it here. Yeah, we'll get some help with that because um, it would be it would be really nice to get some reassurance as humans when we look at a large list of data like this. It's like, well, you know, and those of us that know what it should look like, we're seeing what it should look like. I'm sure you are too. You, your, the risk is pretty low here, but the fact that the visualization function doesn't work is a little concerning. So we'll get some help with that. And then we'll be able to have pretty pictures because a picture is worth a thousand words. A video is worth a thousand pictures. It's just better to get it working. Right. So if we look at the the document, so what is a FlexLink transmitter doing right now? It It's... Um, it's, it's generated, um, I don't think it's generated AGC burst yet, but we generated a preamble. Oh, hold on, let's, let me check to see if it generated AGC burst. Yeah, Go it's to a the good, top of this thing. It's a good question. Yeah, like, so that's a... AGC burst, it's there. Okay, and... so it's available. It should be available by this point? Yeah, so it it's, it's um, when we first, create an instance of the FlexLink transmitter in our code. It's just called, the instance is called transmitter. Um, but when we do that, we call generate AGC burst. You give the sample rate, it generates AGC burst. You do the preamble A and preamble B. So at this point, you, you, you've gotten this, you got this, you got this. Um, the reference, field symbol. I think we did that. That was in Maine. And then we did the signal field, I believe. Yeah, um, I, and I think so. Isn't that in the configuration? We... Like that's in the config. Yeah, I think so. So, so um, and then we did, uh, we created a list of payload A and in, in there, we're also going to create a list for payload B, but they haven't been been mapped into the resource grid yet so we we've created these components at this point so if we go we go back to um where, we, where are we at in so in the debugger um 
so if we the, we're in encode we're in the function called encode payload right now right so that's at this point right here we're i'm about to step out of it but i just didn't want to step out of it yet right go to the the calling function which is main uh, we're just calling it modular so we're we're going to step out of here and then it'll save it to payload a and then the same thing will happen here so the okay. um the So where in the world do so we build we need to build two things. And then if we go to um so the signal field here. Is that so these are all the kind of variables and instances of the signal field there. And then um but where do we do the control like here we, we were saying okay is a control information i actually created already um so if i if i go to um just go to the transmitter here at this point and you you don't remember so here's a signal mm, well I, I remember the con info is here yeah the control info information for in the Python model tends to be derivative. Like it's like, okay, so you set all these things in config then the control information follows from that. So that's that's what I remember from, from reading through. Yeah, but in the code, is it actually happening? Okay, so. No, it happens so pretty in, early. Like from my recollection, the control yeah. information is built pretty early in the process. Yeah, so this flex length config here, we, we have a, um flex link parameters file here at fp in the config the control information is here and this is this is it right here so that control information is in here that point and then when we create the transmitter the flex link config um it, you know, it passes this entire uh, flexing config structure, and then um, that that is associated with the transmitter when it's created. So, if we look into here, um, flexing config is equal to this. Where we should be in the um, go in here, and then it's passed the configuration and control info right here so it serves all so config control info is here i don't think it's being used quite yet uh, i need some help here so here's a yeah i don't see it being info. used like i don't see it being used very very quickly but but i think it's yes. there like it the the control stuff that's it's and i think this instinct is correct like as soon as the configurations are set down like as soon as you get them then any sort of control field or any sort of um you know any anything that needs to actually affect the the operation should be enforced and available pretty pretty early but there's a lot of other stuff yeah. that happens like and, th and then it goes back to i think doing um you know the things that happen for every transmission or more mundane activities but it, it, i think it's available like you should it's th available th right but um so bill we're so build tx waveform isn't complete yet all right, so that's what I mean. As far do you, as like, do you know what's do you, do you know what's missing from the build the TX waveform? Yeah, I mean the that's what I'm saying. One thing the 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 config uh, thing is, is part of control info here, right? Or um, yeah, past configuration. Um, and then that's control control has got a bunch of components in there but i think basically what has to happen is um where's my phone so the, so 
So I think all these things, the data is available more or less at, at that time, but then we, we need to now yeah. map it into a resource grid. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so that's one of the things that I was working on. Okay, is, good. Okay. So now that we have a bunch of lists. So it's not, so what you're saying we, is that the mapping of the data into the resource grid is not completely working in the Python model yet. Well, it's not not implemented yet. It's okay. Not that it's not working. It's just not. No, no, no. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like that—that that was my take on the when I when I read through the Python, and that is this that is totally the same state that we have over on the HDL and Simulink side too. So we we do not, are we are not yet mapping data to the resource grid in either, you know, in either approach, and we need both because. That's sort of the systems engineering approach is like we have a we have a model in Python that that does the system that implements the system and then we are implementing this in HDL and that we are what we are looking for is for the simulation side and the HDL actual simulation side to match. So what I'm hoping for is like I, I'm hoping for the Python side to get there first so that we have you know, a golden set of, you know, here is your, here's your stimulus, here's your response. If your HDL matches that, you're good. So that that's kind of what I'm after uh, to get it mm -hmm. working. You know, it, it's a very standard approach, um, you know. So so when whenever we can get the Python model complete for the transmit side of Neptune, I'm going to be really happy because that means that that you're out of the critical path and and the HDL people are in the critical path. That's All right. So is okay, there any so... is there any, is there like anything that I can do to help like get it like like what do you what do you need to do? What's what's left to do to get it to to map everything correctly and and to construct the waveforms and 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 then put them out over the air? Yeah. So I I think that. Um... So this file right here, resource grid mapper, that's that's in that's in um, yeah, yeah that's right a now, that that's a yeah that's a good one and it's like that if as long as you have everything in the format it needs it's going to map everything to this resource grid and you know OFDM has this well, hold on, hold on. this whole but, but concept I mean, you're saying that that is in Git right now or well I think so you verify that yeah, yeah I've okay. read a I've read through a resource grid mapper you know, a rudimentary resource grid mapper, and it should be rudimentary. Like the resource grid mapper is simply just like a, you know, I'm an operator. I'm going to connect your call to, you know, like a, you can think of the resource grid mapper as a lot of operators in parallel. Like they're all just simply connecting up. This goes there and this goes there. And then there's a whole. Well, what, what, what it's, well, not, not quite. I mean, what it's doing is, it's taking the data that is that is here in that's been you know the mm -hmm. data for these fields have been generated they're right. lists that yes each, each one of these are lists and then um, at some point you need to give it you know they're they're based a list of samples um, values and they they need to be in IQ format so. Yeah. And then what we need to do is we take those IQ values and populate them. Right. You know, going up this way on the resource grid. This is the grid itself. Right. And that's what that function does. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, I so, agree. That's, uh, that's my understanding of what it's supposed to be doing. Like this, at this level, once you decide to map, like you've done all the hard work. So I guess my mm -hmm. bias here is that the hard work of, essentially multiplexing serial to parallel data as you're doing it ahead of time. And the the resource grid mapper is simply saying, who are you? Did you go here? In the most efficient way possible. Now, if we need to rejigger that and not be so distinct about like, okay, it's just a mapper versus, you know, more higher level decision-making, you know, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole IEEE paper right there, but 
to me, the mapper is like, okay, you've done all the hard work. You've told me what you are. Everything's tagged. Everything's in the category. And I just need to plunk it down into the right spot. And that's going to be very quick. If latency is the goal anyway. here, then, then we need that sort of thing. The mapper needs to be really, really fast and it needs to know what it's got. Yeah. Um, anyways, the, so this is kind of the start of a resource grid mapper. So you'll take your IQ symbols and map it in the, in, in, into the grid. And it kind of gives you, um, there's some yeah. example code of how to use it with only yeah. 15. So that's, it that's it ex small. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. That sort of, so these sorts of decisions here or to make this layer, this part of the process really fast. Like that's mm -hmm. where we get our low latency claim is that we can put the data into the, into the symbol very quickly. It like, it's that we've done the hard work of figuring out what goes where as much as possible ahead of time. Um, yeah. And we, so the, yeah this... we, and we can test this, we can, we can prove that that's what's happening. So in, in Python, what we're doing is we, we need to, um, uh, you, you have a resource grid going here. So you're taking that list and populating up here, but you also have this, these reference signals, P1 and P0. So when, whenever, in this case here on this column or this column here, you're taking the reference signals, you output it, and then you a data quantum sim, data signal, and then then on these other ones you you um, you put in data. So in 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 that resource grid mapper that I coded, the it has a pattern that defines this this vertical pattern, and then also this. This horizontal, how often do you want to insert that pattern in there? So here is a one, two, three, four, and then one, two, three, four, right? Right. So in that research grid map, for it, you, you you feed it the data in such a way that you, you want to populate this first kind of chunk of data and then the next pilot symbols. So that's more or less how that thing works. Right. And then uh, here, although it's fixed, we have our pilot symbol is just, you know, a complex value here. It's just essentially, a ton, you know, at that, at that, um, let's say, uh, bin, frequency bin, it's a tone. It's essentially a tone. There's a, one tone for P1 and one tone for P0. Um, right. And there, it's the same tone. They're just kind of phase inverted, right? Correct. Anyway, so so that's how that resource grid mapper here works. It just needs to be modified to to you know you you give it a number of subcarriers, a number of symbols for that for what it's mapping. Meaning, like if we go back to the um, this is one OFDM signal. This is another one. This is another one. This is another one. So there's essentially four in this group and then it repeats so right this one here is saying number is five but i mean i could have just said four if we if we run this thing here um we can see what it looks like let's see here if it um so so here's here's the bit string that was generated right and then um, and then here's the mapped resource grid as a 2D array. And you see here, um, number of subcarriers in my case is just 16. So I go, um, you know, starting at the bottom here, I go pilot, pilot, value, pilot, pilot, value. And then uh, all the values are the same, by the way. So then value, 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 and then value. So then the first column is your pilots, and then the rest of them are just values. Right. So that's kind of how this this Python model works on there, and we just need to um, modify it. So then, 
we can do, you know, like in this case, a resource grid of 901, you know, and right. build this thing out. Then as you get data, it, it pops the data and it populates these things. And then, um, and then you have to run it again for the next set of pilot symbols. So it does chunk, 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 chunk. So then you get more data and then the same thing. Right. Yeah, I can't wait to show this over the air. Anyways, I, I really don't have much more than that. I, okay. That, that, I kind of wanted to do. Well, that's a lot. With, <laughs> that's a great walkthrough. Visualization. Yeah. And, yeah. Let's um, uh, now let's get that working, and because that's going to be super valuable and very, very effective. So I'll help all I can to get the, the visualization, uh, import working. Yeah. Um. I really don't have anything else other than that. Okay. I have a little bit to report on the HCL side. Uh. I, I think we have a few more minutes and what I'll do is uh, I'll try to share the screen uh, for the Trello board uh, because what I've done is on the Trello board there's cards so if you're not familiar with the Trello board it's to do doing done a Kanban board on a web page and Leonard has uh, spearheaded and and is in charge of a Trello board for for Neptune and one of the boards uh, in the workspace for Neptune is uh, called HDL for Hardware Descriptive Language. So what I'll do is, let's see if I can find my, I'll just share the entire desktop. So if this, uh oh. It's not letting me share, and I don't know why. So what I'll do is, um, for the recording, I'll just put in a walkthrough of the work on this. Or no, wait, let's see if this works. I'll just click share. Okay, good. Okay, I'm screen sharing the Trello board. So you should see like a like a desktop and I'll make it bigger. Do you see like a Trello card? Yep. I think I heard a yes. Is that, did I hear a yes? Yeah, yes, Mr. We were able to see oh. your Trello card. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, good. Yeah, so we, we kicked off this this Trello board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard, for, for doing this. Uh, so it helps organize the work and splits it into tasks. Um, and it's in the categories of to do and doing and then done. So one of the doing cards, um, along with complete modeling, um, the everything in, in, uh, in Python is to write some documentation on the HDL coder process. So HDL coder is a toolbox in MATLAB and Simulink from the company MathWorks that allows you to take a Simulink or MATLAB model or a Simulink with MATLAB functions in it from, you know, MathLand, Simulink, MATLAB, all the way to uh, freely publishable, you own it, hardware descriptive language expressions, like it's source code that you can then use for, for FPGA work. And so here is our card that we have for the writing the documentation on the HDL coder process, since this is a big learning curve type of thing. So this is a Trello card. If you're familiar with it, it should look familiar. If you're not, then it's essentially a task organization function. And there's the members here, there's labels. So we're putting this in the documentation category and you can select your level of notifications. Uh, if you're on the card, you can add uh, to it over here. There's all sorts of things you can do. You can add attachments to it. So I have a couple of screenshots of the Simulink model along the way and what it, you know what it looks like because uh, it's changed. And here are the items that we've done, things that are crossed out. So, so this would be, if you wanted to do this, you would say uh, select checklist and it will just handle a checklist for you. So we got MATLAB running on an account mat. What we did at ORI is we moved our MATLAB 
uh, and all of the HDL coder toolboxes. We have all the toolboxes for MATLAB and Simulink. We moved it to a, an account called MATT, M-A-T-T, -T, to, to let people use it that are, you know, authorized on the in uh, Remote Labs West that have a virtual machine account. If you, if you can get in there, then you can log in to, to Matt and you can run uh, a full instance of MATLAB. And you also have access from this account to the, the uh, floating license for Vovado, which is important for HDL Coder because it's turning Simulink code into uh, HDL code. And it asks you for a target. And since we are using large FPGAs, we need the full license from Vovado or from Xilinx slash AMD. Uh, so what we did is we got it running. Thank you very much to uh, to Paul and to everybody at uh, that supports Remote Labs uh, West. This was a big, big deal to to get this working. Uh, you know, and we also made it possible that within Simulink and MATLAB that you were able to update our Neptune repository directly from MATLAB. So we had to confirm that the git config credential helper worked and it works on a per repository basis. So when you log in, you set up your own repository, you tag it with your personal username, since it's a shared account, this is important. You need to set up, you know, unless you want to type in your very, very long credential for Git for GitHub every single time when you update our repository, then you need to do this. And and it it works. We've we've got this uh uh documented. So we confirmed that that was working. That's great. Makes it easy to use this particular type of account and update repositories at ORI. Um, so what we did is we decided that instead of making people uh, run the OFDM.m script that does a Neptune OFDM waveform, instead of making them run it every time, that we would export the workspace or the, all the variables from that particular part of the script export it and then you can import it when you show up and it does this automatically in the script so if you drop down to the bottom it's currently the fourth section of the script you just run that section of the script and you can get all of the values all of the stuff will be done for you this saves you about 15 minutes of computer time on remote labs west we converted all the simulate files and matlab files to 2023b uh, because there was all sorts of different files with all sorts of different versions of MATLAB. Uh, we added code to call up the Simulink models at the end so that when you run this particular thing, it not only loads up all of the waveforms and everything for you, but it also calls up the Simulink uh, script that, or Simulink model that we're working on. So you don't have to go in and, and type and figure out where it is. And, and where it is, is where you cloned it. So you clone the Neptune repository, and then it this, this script should work for you. So we updated with recent work. Uh, we started a notes file in Simulink. This is a side-loaded file, with the it, and the extension is MLDATX. So every time that you clone the repository, you should be getting a Simulink um, essentially notes file. So it's a scratch file. You have a question, you have problems. This is where, you know, you can, you can consult for, for kind of like some on the ground, you know, what, what the heck is going on, uh, source of information. We made a subsystem. So the Simulink model was flat, uh, but the Simulink model, what we're trying to do is have a stimulus and, a, and, a, and maybe some error checking and some, some code checking. But the actual part that's going to get implemented on the FPGA needs to be a subsystem so that HDL Coder Toolbox can target it. So we did that. We separated and mod, you know, modularized uh, our, you know, partitioned the Simulink model to where it can function as here's the test bench stuff outside. And the actual part that is going to be implemented on our FPGA dev boards is a subsystem. So a subsystem in Simulink is really an object. It is very similar to modules in Verilog or whatever. So this has worked. HDL Coder figured it out like very quickly. Like this is the right thing to do. This is this is how you do it. 
Uh, we made a video about the work done so far. It's on our YouTube. Um, and then we added support packages for HDL Coder to our, so we, when we, this is because we had to transition uh, versions. Um, uh oh, here we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so so we did videos. We 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 took a day to document the work. Added all the support packages because we're moving forward with 2023A uh, workflow advisor, which is the way that HDL Coder works. So the way that the toolbox uh, approaches a simulate model is that it gives you a workflow advisor. We got all the way up to the point where we needed to have fixed point. Our model was in double um, complex, uh, but we went ahead and started to see if we could see how far we could get. And this was a, a, a good place to quit. Then after we converted our model to fixed point, we succeeded up to the point of sample rates needing to be the same for the input and output. And this is kind of a big deal. I didn't really think of this after talking to other people that have done this a lot, this is a common problem. So this is where we're at today. What we need to do is get our model working with the sample rates being the same, but the input side, the data being delivered and the output side. And this actually matches up pretty well with the FPA, FPGA dev station. We do not want to have a bunch of different clocks. So the usual way to do this is interpolation or decimation uh, multi-rate blocks, and we're making a lot of progress here, but as of today, this is not yet, uh, fixed. Now in the future, our plan was to attempt the HDL coder OFDM walkthrough from MathWorks. because so they have an example for OFDM, filtered OFDM that they walk through for LTE, for LTE people, customers, what you can, you can tell it's like targeted towards commercial sector and I wanted to walk through this with with Talak to to like okay here's how it's done. We still sort of haven't done this because we've learned so much and gotten so much project uh, progress on Neptune stuff. And then I originally said okay use what we learned from that example from MathWorks and the simulating model. So at this point maybe Talak should just go ahead and do this walk through this <laughs> and then come back and tell us what we're doing wrong on on Neptune. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the checklist section or the items in progress. Uh, the and then I wrote a bunch of notes, and these notes uh, are have turned out. Some of this is valuable, and some of it's not. Some of it's just like a collection of what I did. But the how to use HDL coder uh, is going to get moved as a markdown document in the repo, along with our, how do you implement, or how do you integrate your own IP into the uh, reference design from analog devices? So that's where I tried to capture uh, exactly all the different things that were a problem. And there's lots of stuff, like we got held up uh, by all sorts of different things here. So, you know, if you're interested, you can kind of like read through it um but uh, some good lessons learned like a good stack overflow uh thing uh and then ed found a tutorial about fixed point conversion here and he had some feedback as we previously mentioned about the about things uh the yeah, alternate architectures uh we published some videos we'll have another video very very soon and yeah, that's a, that's a good summer, summary. So we're, we're, we're trying to keep like lessons learned and the actual things that, uh, that happened on this, this process uh, captured here. And then this is not the only place it will be. The goal is to get this out to a markdown document in our repository so that it's a little more findable uh, and polished. So it, there are some cul-de-sacs and dead ends and oopsie doos and oh, bugs, genuine bugs that we, either we introduced or we that we encountered in the in the uh, Trello card. Okay, that's that's a good summary of where we're at on the HDL side. I'm gonna stop sharing and any questions or comments? Uh, Michelle, where's the, the video that you're talking about? They're all on YouTube. Um uh, just under 
Open Research Institute. Uh, They're uh, on the ORI account, YouTube, in the Neptune playlist. We have a playlist for Neptune, so we we put everything there. So the the, the any sort of uh, walkthrough video or any of these meetings will be in the Neptune playlist on YouTube. Uh, I I tried posting the YouTube link in the chat. Uh, I think that might be helpful. Okay, let me do that. Uh, no, Michelle, I said I, I already posted the link in the chat. Uh, that, that's what I meant. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. you did. Okay, yeah. yeah, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't get a little flag on that. Yes. So okay. thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, Talak has posted the, the link in uh, chat. Okay, yeah, now I got my screen back under under control. <laughs> And I can see it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah, any uh, any questions or comments or any concerns about the next week? I think what we're going to do on the HDL side is just keep trying to implement and and uh, get the HDL coder to produce HDL code for the core center functions of OFDM, and then all of the the wonderful things going on in the spec that produce a resource grid that those we will add uh, as as soon as we can. Um, but, you know, just getting our, just getting the IFFT, which is the heart of the whole thing. Like, you know, we're turning tones into a time series and then we're kicking it out over the air. That that's, that's what we're trying to get working. Um, that is very rudimentary. It is, it is really not, like, like if you looked at it, you go, there's nothing to do with Neptune here. It's just a IFFT that is that is producing, uh, you know, a time series that goes, a complex time series that goes out over the air. However, once we once we have that working consistently, that is a big deal, and it gives us the power to then add in. Here's the data that you're going to then convert from these tones to the time series. And the good news is that two days ago, we, we actually connected up the output. So the I's and the Q's are actually delivered to the 9002 I and Q transmitter hardware. So the interfaces, we believe, are, are all the way through to the transmitter. And so what we have now is just random. What we do is we set up two, you know, if you've seen the video, we have two, uh, you know, essentially sine waves that are added together to give a more complicated signal. That is their input. That's it. That's that's all we got. So it's not a resource grid. It's not data versus control words. It's just garbage. But it's, you know, random-ish garbage. And that's what's that's what's being transmitted. And the goal is is like to okay, if we can transmit this and confirm that that's what's going out of the air in the lab, that's a that's a good thing. So we'll, you know, so once we kind of get our, our, our fingers on it and are able to actually manipulate symbols over the air and they're uh, deterministic, uh, that's a huge step forward to being able to, to actually transmit a legit Neptune signal. So not, not too far away, actually. Um, and, and good stuff. It was very nice to see all of the, the interfaces come together. And for the the HDL coder to to you know we've been knocking down the errors, and getting much much more close to to having publishable HDL code, um, and it's still an open question on how much of the uh, construction of the of the data uh, goes in to the HDL. Like I'd like to put as much as possible into hardware so that we get the latency down as low as possible. Uh, I think right now the IFFT is like 208 clock cycles at this point latency. Uh, not bad at all because it's a streaming algorithm that we picked rather than load all the 1024 up. Um, but but we will be uh, implementing both styles. Like the we'll be we'll be trying both to to make sure that at 1024 uh, length that we're 
that we're doing the right thing by by picking the streaming style of IFFT. All right, that's it for my end. Uh, I think I've got uh, no specific update. I'm just tagging along with Michelle's progress on on producing the the MATLAB HDL coder setup. Uh, I think I've, I've still yet to uh, reproduce the fixed point specific at work that which I'm uh, that is yet to start. So maybe after that, I'll as as Michelle pointed out, I'll be trying to do the the HDL transmitter, sorry, the OFDM transmitter example from MATLAB. Uh, I, I think as, as it said, it's a good point to, to start doing it so that we understand what's, what's missing uh, from our side. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the two parts maybe, you know, I'll, I'll be concentrating this week on. Yeah, I spent a lot of time with the fixed point tool in, in uh, Simulink and, and it had some weird suggestions. So what I ended up doing was just simply putting a conversion block into the into the simulating model manually, and I, you know, so, and and then I I I went ahead and uploaded that to the repo. So the only difference between the double, you know, the 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 floating point and the fixed point was this one block, and it works. It carries you through. Like okay, so you know, you create these two. Uh, sine waves and doubles you add them together and then and then that sum of sine waves is delivered to the IFFT so to me like the IFFT is the beginning of the actual target like that's that's the that's the Neptune you know circuit and and this stimulus that you're giving it the data that you're giving it well it doesn't matter what it is but it has to be fixed point so I was like okay fine I'll just put in a convert block so that's currently the design in the repo for Neptune is our our model that worked with doubles all the way through is now getting a fixed point. You know, so it's 16 bits for I, 16 bits for Q, because it's a 16 bit complex signal that's being delivered to it. That that should be good, you know. But I I spent I said probably 10 or 11 hours on on trying to use the fixed point tool, and it was putting in conversion blocks inside the deserializer, like deep into the design. And so I'm like, it must be deciding things at a level that I don't appreciate yet, but I'm just gonna go ahead and short circuit this. Like, okay, fine, you know, we'll come back to this later, but like set aside the, the yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, set aside the fancy tool. And it, I learned a lot. So I, I, I tried to put that into the Trello, the Trello card. There is a, go ahead and optimize my design permanently uh, option. There is a, hey, let me see what you're doing to my design option. And then there is a, hey, let me look at how my fixed point choice plays well with uh, varying data. And that one, that final one, is actually the most useful one. So you go ahead as a human, you fi you figure out you want 16 bits, you want 32 bits, you want eight bits, fine, pick it. And then you set up a series of test cases at, with, co it's called like coverage, I think is the name for it in the fixed point tool. And it's like really cool. So you like get this amazing visualization of, okay, if you pick eight bits, you are going to saturate. Like, it's like, sorry, you're going to saturate like 80% of the time. So you have to manage your input data this way. And if you pick 16 or 32, here's what happens. Underflows, overflows, right up the middle. So that one turned out to be the most interesting. But I was like, I was expecting it, honestly, to I tell you what my data is. I tell you what my, my data range is. Like, oh, 0.2 to 32.7 volts. Okay, you tell me what. How, how, what the what the fixed point solution should be for this system given i've i've given you all of the simulink model you know what my model is here's the input data i was expecting it to return to me here's the fixed point solution and that that wasn't what the coverage option that third option in the fixed point tool does y you have to pick a fixed point value mm -hmm. right okay so I, I had it backwards, but but it turned out to be super super useful, and the visualizations are top notch for that particular option. But the other options, it was just randomly putting crap in my model, and I'm like, well, I just 
I'm not sure I can tolerate you putting three different conversion blocks in my deserializer alone. Like, does that really solve it? Maybe it does. Uh, so we'll just keep working on this and, you know, maybe next week I'll go, wow, I was ignorant of the power <laughs> of the of the fixed point tool. But until then, I mean, we know that we're going to get fixed point in, input. So it's like, okay, there's lots of fancy stuff in this fixed point conversion tool in HDL Coder. Great. But we already know what we're getting. So let's go ahead and put that block in. And, and after that, HDL Coder uh, picked up and ran with it until it ran into the problem that I have a different clock scheme for the input versus the output. The input's at 20.48 megahertz, essentially. The output is the symbol coming out at 20 kilohertz. And I went and talked to, to some ASIC people, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we can help you. We can fix this out. And they're like, oh, well, the 81. So they pointed out that the 81 value for the cyclic prefix, because that's what's messing things up. If you pick 81 samples for your cyclic prefix, then the 1106 number that we get and the 1024 number that we started with are not compatible at all. So I was like, oh. So I looked at a little harder at the 81 and, and your prefix, your cyclic prefix needs to be larger than any multipath that you're expecting along the way in OFDM. I'm like, well, can't we pick a number that actually makes the clock schemes work out? Like maybe this, like, is this a magic number? Is it an absolute maximum, an absolute minimum? I don't know, but it it is in the realm. Like it, this, the 81, uh, eight, the length of 81 for the cyclic prefix is legit. It's like, it's from LTE. They did lots and lots and lots of channel sounding and signal sounding, you know, physics based stuff. But if we could get it to where it would, <laughs> If we get get the 81 to move to a number that was um, clock rate compatible, then this would, if it was an integer multiple or some sort of integer multiple ratio, then this problem would be a lot easier to solve. So that's that's what I learned over the past week, and we'll we'll keep working at it. Uh, you know, it, it so it may be a more complicated like solution, and then HDL coder will probably. Uh, simplify it out. So this is this is not an uncommon thing in digital design where you have to match clock rates and they're not integer multiples or easy ratios. Uh, so so as far as far as the plan is like from right now today is to move forward with fixing the clock rates for the input and output, even though there's this awkward ratio from the cyclic prefix, and then move forward, get a design and review it. So that's that's the plan. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Well, so before we close, anybody got anything else or anything that they want to see done? Mm, nope. Okay. Thank you, everybody. This is this is really cool. We've made made a lot of great progress. And uh, anybody following along, if you're interested in this and want to support it, then. Uh, Hey, just just come to um, openresearch.institute, click the getting started link, and let us know you're out there. Thanks so much. All right, see you on Slack. Thank you. Bye bye.